see everybody. Let me move this out of the way. My daughter wants to go to the playground in case you can't hear. <laughs> she spends a lot of time down there. I just want to say how great it is to be together as a church and worship together and to spend some time in prayer, Sylvia. We've been spending all week listening to everybody say and do everything else. You could do a lot of things after you've prayed, but you could do nothing, nothing, until you've prayed. Well, that's not the sermon, but that one's free. Let's um, open our, our time together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can have a relationship with you, Lord, that we can come to you, Lord, in front of a throne of grace and mercy to find help and to get wisdom, Lord, things that you promised to give us if we ask for it, Lord. And we come this morning, Lord, we continue to worship you, Lord. We thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you for every person here. We thank you for every person that's joining us virtually, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be full in us. And Lord, would your Holy Spirit dwell among us, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been, we are living in a very interesting time. You know, it's interesting. I feel like we've been saying that for a lot of years of our life, but just when we think we're in the most interesting time, it gets a more interesting, doesn't it? And what are we to do? What are we to think about? What are we to focus on? Well, that's why we have started a sermon series talking about God, who God is, God's attributes. You know, A.W. Tozer said, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. If we want revival, if we want God to do work in our hearts, then, we, then it's crucial that we work on changing our perspective about who God is. Our culture might change, views might change, politicians might change, governments could change, but our God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the question is, do we really see God for who he truly is? Do we see God for who he really is? A preschool teacher watched as her, a little three-year-old girl drew something on a piece of paper. What are you drawing? The teacher asked. I'm drawing a picture of God, was the little girl's reply. The teacher says, the teacher says oh, you can't do that. Nobody knows what God looks like. And without looking up, the little girl says, well, they will now. Have you ever wondered what God looks like? I suspect that most of you have. What ideas come into your mind? What images when you think about God? If you've seen some of the great religious paintings from the high renaissance, you, you know that God is depicted as an elderly man with a large muscular form, flowing long white hair and a beard to match, and cloaked with a, with a, with a white cloak on and a stern, mean look on his face, right? And he's pointing to something. That's how God appears in Michelangelo's famous fresco, The Creation of Adam, which adorns the ceiling of the Sistine, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Or maybe you've seen the movie Bruce Almighty. And maybe to you, when you think of God, you think he bears a strange resemblance to the actor Morgan Freeman. But does God actually look like any of these things? The reality is nobody knows what God looks like. The Bible never presents us with a picture, a physical description of God. And why not? Well, simply put, because God is spirit. God's very nature and essence is spiritual. Even though he's a living and personal being, he's an, he's an immaterial substance, and therefore he's invisible. So this morning, we're going to look at what it means that God is spiritual and what the implications are for our lives. God, what does it mean that God is spirit, and what are the implications for our lives? So first, God, God is spirit. God is spirit. The clearest biblical, biblical statement that we have of God's spiritual essence is found in the famous story of the woman, of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. Now, we're not, we're not going to read the entire thing. But just to, to set the context of the first 19 verses or so, Jesus was needed to travel north from Judea to Galilee. But instead of taking a detour, you see, when, when the Jews would take this, this trip, they would, they would take a detour all the way around this region called Samaria. Why? Well, 
You see, because racism is, an, is a new thing, contrary to what some people might think. The Jews called the Samaritans half-breeds, a mixed race. They didn't like them. So they travel all the way around just to perpetuate the, their prejudice against this mixed race of people. But Jesus, on this particular trip, he went straight through. And when he got near to, uh, to a town of Sychar, he rested by Jacob's well. He was thirsty and tired from walking during the, 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 the heat of the day. And then a Samaritan woman came to draw, a woman to draw water from the well. And, and at that moment, Jesus broke all racial and gender barriers of Jews not speaking to Samaritans and men not speaking to women. This woman was startled by Jesus as Jesus is um, the direct neglect of these social customs. And it, and it caused a conversation to, to occur about Jesus' identity. She says, Jews don't, don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus, she, Jesus asked her for a drink of water. She was shocked. She says, what are you asking me for a drink of water? Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And Jesus said, woman, if you knew who it was that was asking you for a drink of water, you would ask him for a drink, and he would have given you living water. Now, Jesus' offer of living water represents a spiritual life. Even further, Jesus reveals the fact that this woman has had five husbands, and in fact, the man that she was currently living with was not her husband. I wish I could have seen the look on the woman's face when Jesus said that to her. The woman immediately recognized that Jesus was a prophet, as would I, and she was open and willing to listen to whatever he had to say. And Jesus worked the conversation around the spiritual things in, in, in verse 20. And he was, he was responding to the woman's comment about where people ought to worship. And he says this, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither on, in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know, but we worship which we, that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But, the hour, but an hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Jesus is saying, look, true worship, for true worship to, to occur, it doesn't have to happen in, in Samaria. It doesn't happen to happen in Jerusalem or any particular place. For true worship has nothing to do with physical location but it has everything to do with a person's inner spiritual condition. Unless a person comes to the true knowledge of who God is, unless his or her spirit has been regenerated, it's impossible, impossible to worship God, no matter where you are on the face of the earth. And, and, it, and it was at this point in the conversation that Jesus said something about God which had never been clearly stated before. It, it was never clearly stated before. All through the Old Testament, the truth was apparent, but it had never been put into plain words until Jesus says this in verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. And if you read that in the original writing that was written, the Greek text, there's no article before the word spirit. That means the emphasis of the word is, is emphasizing its quality or its essence. And even more, the word spirit is, occurs in the front of the sentence for emphasis. In other words, Jesus is saying, God is spirit. He didn't leave any room for doubt or argument. God is spirit. But what does that mean? Well, that's, that's what we, we, see, we see this morning. First, it means God is spirit, so he's immaterial. God is spirit. So he's immaterial. He, he, doesn't have a, he doesn't have a body. Jesus reaffirmed this to his frightened disciples shortly after his resurrection. Maybe you remember the story. Jesus walks in, enters the room in his glorified body, and they thought they'd seen a ghost. They thought they'd seen a spirit. But Jesus calmed them by saying this. He says, see my hands, see my feet. That is, I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as I have. You see, spirits don't have bodies. This might seem like a bit of a problem, right? Because if you know your Bible right away, you're thinking, well, there are some places in the Bible where it does seem to refer to God as having a physical body. For example, it mentions his hand and his ear in Isaiah chapter 59. It mentions his mouth in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 16 and in Matthew chapter 4. 
What did, what, how do we make sense of these? Well, theologians call these anthropomorphisms. And relax, if you don't know, you don't have to write that word down. It just simply means human form. These are, are symbolic representations to help us make sense of God's actions with our finite minds. God has no material substance, and he's not dependent on material things. God dwells in the realm of the spirit. And this has important implications for our lives. God is immaterial. He's spirit, and this has important implications for our lives. See, if we, want, if we know, love, and serve a God who doesn't have a material substance, it should diminish our fascination with material things, shouldn't it? It should diminish our fascination and our desire for material things. And that would make us radically different from the rest of the world around us, would it not? We live in a culture that continually tries to feed its desire for things that money can buy and security that money can provide. But yesterday's luxuries become today's necessities. And the more we get, the less it satisfies. How many of you have experienced this to be the case? If, in fact, if we ever get everything that we truly wanted, none of it would bring any, any contentment to us at all. So let me ask you this morning. Are you still searching for contentment in material things? Or have you embraced God's spirituality? Because God is spirit. He's immaterial. And number two, God is spirit, so he's invisible. God is spirit, so he's invisible. See, spirits are not seen. We can't even see a human spirit. You know, even the closest of human relationships, the closest and the most intimate of friends can't see each other's spirits. You know, I, I've never yet seen Hope's spirit. And no one, none of us can see God. The Apostle Paul called, called God in Colossians, as we saw, the invisible God. In 1 Timothy, he called him the King Eternal, Immortal. Invisible. And John himself, in chapter 1, verse 18, assured us that no man has seen God at any time. Now, mortal men have seen visible manifestations of God, because God used these things to, to reveal certain, communicate certain things about himself to them. Like, for example, when Jesus Christ became human and, and became man in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Bethlehem on Christmas morning. But no one has ever seen God fully in a spiritual being. There's, and there's no way they could. Why? Because God is spiritual. He's invisible. Spiritual or invisible. Now, rather than, this creep, rather than this group creeping us out, it's something that should encourage us. Why? Well, because, because God is invisible, we, we can not only know him, but we can know him apart from our physical sentence, senses. You can know God apart from your physical sense, senses, even when you don't, even when you don't feel good. You know, you don't, you know, you don't have to feel good. I was I, I, one, one of my friends once got advice from a counselor. The counselor's asking him why he drinks. He says, "I want to feel good." He says, "Whoever said you're supposed to feel good?" That's counseling, by the way. That's counseling. But because God is spirit, we can we can see Him apart from apart from our senses. Because you see, we have a spirit too. God is spirit, but we have a spirit housed in our human bodies. And when our spirits are made alive toward God, when they're made alive toward God through new birth in Jesus Christ, we have the capacity to commune with him, with our spirits, anytime, any place, and under any circumstances, even a pandemic, even, even, even in a fiery furnace, anywhere. We can commune with him anytime, anywhere, and under any circumstances. Now, this could be a difficult truth for us to grasp, right? Because our spirits live in physical bodies. And our bodies inhabit a physical universe. And our preoccup a preoccup a preoccupation with the, physical thing, with the physical world makes us try to put our relationship with God in, f in, the, physical, in the physical realm as well, in the physical terms that we can understand. We want to be inspired to worship God by lavish, by, by lavish cathedrals, great art, Pleasant sounds, lovely aromas, and beautifully worded liturgies. In fact, our human nature cries out for religious symbols, images, pictures, things that help us create more of a mood for worship. We 
think that we have to be in a church building to follow certain prescri prescribed procedures, but we, we know that not to be true now, amen? We're, we're, we're perfectly fine out here. Wind it all, by the way. See, God says, you can't reduce me to physical things that can be, to only physical things that can be experienced with your physical senses. I dwell in the realm of the spirit, and that's where I, that's where I desire to meet with you. Physical things might help us direct our attention to God, like his creation. If this beautiful creation doesn't help direct your attention to God, I feel sorry for you. I don't know what to say. But we meet with God in our spirits. That's why we can enjoy God riding to work in our cars in the morning. We can enjoy God pushing a vacuum across the floor, and I've done it many times. I was the first to vacuum the new carpet, by the way. I did the honors yesterday. We can worship God, and we can enjoy him in a Steeler game. Or even crawling across the attic in the fellowship hall running wire, wherever Marshall is. Yeah, there he is. Right, Marshall? We can know God and enjoy him in the spiritual realm apart from our physical senses. Our sense, apart from our physical senses anytime, anywhere. Why? Because God is spirit and he's invisible. Number three, God is spirit so he's alive and personal. God is spirit so he's alive and personal. Now, it seems quite obvious to me that a spirit is alive. Does it seem obvious to you? See, our God, the psalmist says that our God is not an inanimate object like a pagan idol with a mouth that, with mouth that, can, with a mouth that cannot speak, with eyes that cannot hear, and with, ears, with eyes that cannot see, with ears that cannot hear, and with hands that can't accomplish anything. No, our God is alive. He's living. In fact, the very word spirit also means wind <laughs> or breath. And breath is the evidence of life. All throughout the Bible, God is called the living God. Joshua chapter 3, Psalm 84, Thessalonians chapter 1, to name a few. But God is spirit. Also, he's also a person. He's not some impersonal force without a purpose or without a reason. God also has the basic characteristics of personality, intellect, emotions, will. He thinks, he feels, and he acts. And that's good news. That's good news. Because God's a living person, we can know him. We can know him personally. We can communicate with him freely. You know, if God was an inanimate object like, 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 like that table or something else or a statue, there would be no hope of having any kind of personal relationship with him at all. So let me ask you this morning. Do you have a personal relationship with the living God? Do you have a personal relationship with the living God? There is no other hope. There's no, there's no other way to make sense of the world. Has your spirit been regenerated so you can interact with God? Like you saw Sylvia interacting with God. Sylvia is someone who interacts with God. Many of you, I know, I know you. I know, I know you very well. Has your spirit been regenerated so you can act, interact with God who's spirit, who is spirit? Do you love, worship, and serve God with your, with your spirit because he is spirit? God is spirit. That's why we, need to, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Our worship doesn't depend on external and material and physical things because it takes place internally in the spiritual part of our being. Worship is not primarily a physical location. It doesn't, it's not dependent on some physical location. It's not dependent on, on some form or some ritual or some ceremony. Worshiping good is not, is not a matter of creating the right atmosphere or, or, or creating some kind of right mood for worship. It's not even about singing the right kind of music. Worship is a matter of the spirit. We worship God with our spirit because our spirits respond to God's revelation of himself. Have, have you experienced that? Have, have, has God revealed himself to you and have you responded to that? But that's why if you want to know God, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you want to know God, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because God is spirit. He's immaterial, invisible, and he's live and personal. And God wants to know you. God wants you to know him. But you can't know God, and I mean you really, you can't really know God until you have first received the gift of the Holy Spirit through putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. You can't really know God. If all there's something foolishness to you, then it probably is. Because if, if, you haven't, if you have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit through putting your trust in Jesus Christ, 
And second, you can't know God, I mean really know God, unless you continually seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now listen, some people turn the Holy Spirit to some doctrine. Don't turn the Holy Spirit to some doctrine. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. You see, what does it mean? It, it uses a verb that means to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. It's talking about living a life that's in step with the Holy Spirit. You say, what does that look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. Galatians chapter 5 says it looks like it has fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Things that I think I need to see on the 6 o'clock news. Amen? You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. There are certain characteristics. You know, we can't judge people's hearts, but we can be fruit inspectors. We can, we can look for fruit in people's lives. If we want to know God, if we want to really worship God, then we need to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit to, to, to respond to the revelation that God's given you. You might not know what God wants you to do 20 years from now, but don't you know what he wants, wants you to do today to, to be faithful to him? Certainly we do. We know what to do today, right now. And that's how we worship God in spirit and in truth. And we can, do, and we can worship, worship him wherever we are. We have the wonderful privilege of being able to worship God anytime, any place, and under any circumstances. Nobody can steal that from you. Nobody. Nobody. No circumstance can steal that from you. All we need to do is simple. The Bible says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's all. God is spirit. And may we worship him in spirit and in truth together. Together as we partake of the Lord's Supper together. And together as we go about all the daily activities that our, our coming week is going to bring us. Amen? Will you close in prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, help us, Lord, to um, embrace who you are, Lord. And, Lord, and, and you are spirit, Lord. Um, Lord, a third of the Trinity is, is the Holy Spirit, Lord. Not, a, not an eighth. Lord, a third, Lord. And we, we pray, Lord, that we worship you in spirit and in truth. We live lives in cooperation. We would walk in step with the spirit, Lord. And in the little things, Lord, in, in the secret place where nobody sees. Father, I pray that as we um, partake of Lord's Supper together, the first time we've done this together in months, I pray, Lord God, that we would embrace um, these, this for all that it means. And Lord, let this be a time where we examine ourselves, Lord, and, and um, just recommit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen.